Hey guys, it's Shahir from 5 Academy. Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be going through the next 12 skills in the ACT Math 52 Skills video series, where I basically walk through all of the skills that you will see on the actual test on test day and examples of them as well. So in the first two parts, if you haven't seen them already, I recommend you watch them. I go through the first 32, I believe, skills in those videos. If you haven't seen them already, check them out. They will be probably in your recommended or linked down below. So let's get right into this. I have examples for each of these skills. I also have a bit of discussion that I'll give for each one, just so you further understand them, all right? But we are gonna go pretty fast because there's a lot of stuff to get through. So let's get started. First skill, identifying characteristics of graphs based on set conditions or a general solution. So problems like this will ask you to take a general form of a graph, and it might even give you two different equations within this general form, and it'll ask you to identify characteristics. So here you're dealing with translations. So how do we relate these variables here to the translations? Okay, let's do the problem. So this graph is in the coordinate plane. Here's one pl plot, and here's another one translated up into the right of A. Which of the following statements about the two equations is true? So if um, if B is up into the right, so it's up into the right, it looks like, right? These points correspond. That means that the Y, uh, uh, the, the, this point here, the vertex point is going to be higher. So D is going to be greater than K. Um, so yeah, this should be true. D equals K minus one, right? Because here D looks like it's equal to what? Uh, one, K is equal to zero. So is this true? K minus one, actually that doesn't work. So A is gonna be out here. D equals H minus two. There, there's no relationship between D and H. K equals D plus two, that doesn't work either. C equals H plus two. So uh, if C is bigger, that means that it's going to be further to the right. So C, which point is C? C is going to be the point in graph B, which is right here. So this point, let me just label it. It's going to be C comma D. This point is H comma K. So is C going to be equal to H plus two? Well, C is equal to two, H is equal to zero. So this should be right. C is equal to H minus two. So again, H is equal to zero. H minus two is gonna be negative two. So that's that's wrong, all right? That's how you do this type of problem. You have to understand translations for this one, but it could give you uh, something about circles or something about um, a different type of graph, all right? Next problem type is solving problems in context of money. So Kevin works at a local theme park earning an hourly wage of this. His wage is increased by this number due to a promotion. So what is his new wage? So when you're calculating wages like this, when you're working with percentages, if you wanna increase something by a certain percentage, you multiply the original number by one point something where the numbers in these two digits here are going to be the actual percent so 61 percent okay we're increasing by 61 percent 9.5 times 1.61 is going to equal to 15.295 okay actually if you round you have to round up here so that's going to be the amount um now another thing to keep in mind here is that you could also, there's other ways to do this. This is just one way to do it. You could also just calculate 61% of this and add it to, to the original number. Descriptive statistics with frequency counts is the next skill. So here you're gonna be given a frequency chart, which I'll walk you through in just a second. It's kind of like a table, but a little bit different. Uh, it's a little more complex. So um, let's do this. The following table shows the number of students in a class who received certain final grades. Based on their final grades, students were provided coupons to spend at local restaurants with varying coupon amounts depending on student grades. What is the average coupon price distributed per student? So we need to find the average coupon price, okay? So essentially we're using this and, and, and uh, calculating the average of the set of numbers. So you would think, okay, maybe I'll just add up all of these together and we'll divide by what? six, but the issue is there's not just six students. There's eight plus 10 plus eight plus four plus three, whatever the number is, that's your total number of students. So when we look at the average formula, sum is uh, uh, the, the, sorry, the average is equal to what? Average is equal to sum divided by the number of numbers, right? So what's our number of numbers? This is going to be eight plus 10 plus eight plus four plus three. Okay, now what's your sum? What's your sum of all of the coupon amounts? That's gonna be equal to 25 times eight plus 20 times 10 plus 15 times eight, right? Because if I if I add up all the coupon prices, it'll be 825, so it'll be 25 plus 25 plus, plus 25, and then you're gonna add 10 20s. So plus 20 plus, plus 20, and then it goes on, right? So essentially it's going to be 25 times eight plus 10 times 20, and it goes all the way up until three times five. Okay, 
So I'm not going to do the calculation. You can do this on your own. You should get, uh, I might, it might be this answer, I'm forgetting. But the idea is you're multiplying all these together and then you're dividing it by these added up together, all right? So mean, median, and mode for a list of numbers. This is a bit more of a straightforward skill, but it can still get tricky, like in this problem. So let's do this. So what is the median for this list of numbers? So the first step for a median problem is you sort the numbers from least to greatest. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Okay, we have eight numbers, eight numbers, so it looks right. Um, in this case, now what you do with the median is you will cancel out values from the right and then also from the left, one by one. So 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. So when you cal cancel out 4 on each side, you end up with nothing in the middle. Um, so that's not going to work. What you can do instead is cancel out 3 on each side. You have to cancel an even number on each side. And then take the two numbers in the middle and find the average, the middle. Okay, so that's going to be 9. So your answer here is going to be 9, all right? That's how you do mean, median, and mode for a list of uh, an, even, uh, uh, an even number of numbers, okay? If it was an odd number of numbers, like let's say we had an 11 in here, then this 11 would go right here, and then your mean, your median would just be 10, right? Then, then, then if there's an odd number of numbers, then the middle number is just, it, there, it, there is going to be a middle number. But if it's an even number of numbers, then there is no middle number. There's going to be two numbers in the middle, okay? Moving on, area and circumference of a cylinder, uh, of, a, of a circle plus volume of a cylinder. So the partial circle shown below has an angle measure of 240 degrees right here. That's 240 degrees. So if the radius of the partial circle is 5, the area of the shape is what? So how do we do this? Well, we know that the area of a circle is going to be pi r squared, right? And it tells us that the radius is 5. So the total, if, if this was a to if like a full circle, right? Your uh, uh, area of the whole thing would be area equals pi times 25 which is 25 pi. Okay, so now your area has to be less than this. So that's obviously out. These are out. So which one of these should we choose? Okay, so how can we use this angle measure to find the area? What you're going to do is you're going to multiply your original area by a proportion. Okay, we're going to find what percent of the circle is actually made up of this shape. What we can see is if we divide 240 by 360, right, 360 would be if this whole thing was um, if we added on what the rest of the 120 degrees here, then it would be a 360 degree shape. It would be a complete circle, right? So if we multiply 25 pi by the proportion that the partial circle actually takes up, which is 240 out of 360, you'll end up getting 25 pi times 2 over 3, which is going to be 50 pi over 3, essentially saying that this shape right here is two thirds of a circle. And you'll notice that 240 is just two thir thirds of 360. Okay? That's why this proportion makes sense. So as far as these problems, keep in mind, you know, circumference equals 2 pi r, which is equal to pi times diameter, area of a circle equals pi r squared, and volume of a cylinder equals pi r squared times height, which is essentially area times height. Okay, it's just some key formulas. These should help. Area and perimeter of polygons plus computing area of geometric figures when planning and visualization is necessary. So how do we do this type of problem? It's asking us to find the area of the figure so what do you do? You notice that not all the, all the components of the shape are dimensioned. So you have to do a little bit of predicting. So the easiest way to do this is to split this up into easier shapes that you can solve. So this one, you can clearly see the area is 4 times 2. It's a rectangle, assuming that everything is a right angle. So that's going to be 8. Um, what about this shape right here? So I see that this dimension is 2. This is 4. That means that what's left over is this right here right? This right here is going to be 2. So if this is 2, and this is 2, um, and it, since th this is also 2 here, that means that this is 2. So I can calculate this square right here, since I know it's 2 by 2. It's going to be 4. The last step is just calculating this, okay? So again, if I look at this dimension here and compare it with this here, if this is 2, that means that this is going to be 6, because they have to add up to 8, right? The 8 is the entire bottom side length. If you look, it's the entire bottom side length, right? So we can keep that in mind. And if I delete these numbers just to make it easier to see, if we have 4 times 6, that ends up giving you 24. So 24 plus 8 plus 4, you can add that up, and that's going to be your answer, should be this one, if I did my math correctly. All right, we have a few more left. Let's get through this quickly. So locating mo and moving points in the coordinate plane. What translation be, must be made to the point here in order to achieve the point in the graph below? So we want to get to 
2, negative 2. So if I have a point negative 1, so it's going to be negative 1 down 9. So it's going to be all the way like down here. Right, and I want to move it up here. What do I have to do? Well, it looks like I clearly have to go right and up. Okay. It's just a matter of how much. So if we're going from, let's first look at how far we have to go to the right. Okay, 3 or 1. So if I go one unit right from negative 1, I'm just going to end up back at 0. So this is clearly wrong. Three units right is going to get me 1, 2, 3. I'm going to go from 0, 1, 2. So this has to be the right answer. It doesn't even matter how far up we have to go. Okay. So counting points is going to help you with this. Um, this is a very rare problem type, so don't stress too much about it. But it's just moving points. And if you're able to visualize points on the graph, you will do just fine. Circle equations and inequality. So this is an important one because there's a key formula you have to understand. And I'll walk you through it. A particular circle has a circumference of this and is centered on this. Which of the following is the rightmost point on the circle? Circumference equals 2 times pi times r. In this case, it's 50 pi. If I divide both sides by pi, I get 2r equals 50. That means radius is equal to 25, okay? So we need to keep that in mind. Radius is 25, and it's centered here. So if you look at the circle of an equa uh, 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 the equation of a circle, it looks like this, okay? It looks like this. What this is saying here is, uh, th this, there's a lot of things going on here. So ignore x and y, they don't really mean much. You're just plugging points there. But h and k, oh, I also need to write this. This is r squared. OK, so h and k are going to be the center point. So you see how the problem tells you the center point. That's telling you that h is equal to 1, k is equal to negative 11. And the r is just the radius. OK, so r is going to equal 25. All right, so we can take all that into account and make an equation. Uh, actually, in this problem, you don't have to really make an equation. I kind of just walked you through that for no reason. But we can still solve the problem using everything that we just took note of. OK, so the center point is 1 common uh, negative 11. Let's just plot that. Over 1, down 11. So it's going to be like down here. And your circle is going to look something like this. OK, it's asking for the rightmost point. So we know if this is 1, negative 11, the rightmost point is just going to be 25 units to the right, because this radius is equal to 25. So if I take this x-coordinate and add 25 to it, I end up getting 26, negative 11. So that's your answer right there. Okay. Keeping in mind the visualization and the equation of the circle is going to help you solve that. Deriving info about geometric figures. So here you're going to be given a geometric figure or some information about it, and you have to derive the rest of the information. So it's a little bit of a reverse solve problem. A rectangular prism has edge lengths of 1, 2, and 3 feet. What is the sum of the edge lengths of the shape in feet? So if you look at a rectangular prism, let me make it rectangular. This looks very bad, but it gets the job done. Okay, So you have length, let's do length, width, and height. Okay, So it's telling you, let's just say this is 1, this is 2, this is 3. Okay. So what is the sum of the edge lengths? If I count the edge lengths, well, I can set the w to be equal to this color. So all of these dimensions are w. There's an imaginary one down there. The height can be the vertical ones. I have four of them. And then the length can be these long ones. Okay, So I see I have four of each. So I can just take each of these, multiply by four, and add them together. So four times one plus four times 2 plus 4 times 3 equal to 4 times 6. It's 24. Let's change that color. It's probably very painful to look at. So it's 24. OK, so visualization is going to help you with these type of problems, drawing things out and counting whatever quantities you're dealing with. We have just a few more left. Let's get through these very quickly. Matching trig functions with their graph. So you're, if imagine you're given a trig function like this. How can you find the graph, uh, the, the equation to match the graph or vice versa? So which of the following equations does the graph below accurately represent? So what, what factors do we take into account? There's three of them. First is amplitude. I'll walk you through that. Second is period. And third is going to be uh, behavior at x equals 1. Okay, uh, Sorry, x equals 0. So let's do all of these. So amplitude. What's the amplitude of this equation? Well, that's just going to be the maximum minus the minimum. So 1 minus negative 1 divided by 2, okay? Which is just 1. 
in essence, it's the distance from the center of the graph up to the maximum value. Usually it's going to be one. It could be uh, uh, a different value if, if it's if it has a different amplitude. Okay, so this is equal to one. Now where this comes in, if I write the equation of sine or cosine, y equals a sine bx. So a is the amplitude. Okay, so so far we know that a can't be uh, it has to be one and all of these answer options have an amplitude of one. So this doesn't really help Period so period is equal to 2 pi over B. Okay, so uh, Period essentially measures how long it takes for one cycle of the graph to Happen so in order for you to get back to the same point to the same maximum or to the same minimum not the same x-intercept because x-intercepts happen twice as often, right? You see x-intercepts happen four times in this stretch, but there's only one period Sorry, three times, but there's one period. So uh, don't measure x-intercepts. Measure peak to peak or minimum to minimum. All right, so that's how you measure period. That's what period means. It's just the distance to have one one cycle or one repetition. Um, and it's related to the equation via this uh, number b. So what's uh, uh, the period here? It looks like to get from here to here, we cover a distance of pi. So period has to equal pi. So I can solve this for b, right? I can divide both sides by, let me multiply both sides by b. So 2 pi equals b pi. Clearly, if I divide by pi on both sides, we get b equals 2, OK? So this is out, this is out, this is out, this is out. That's the answer. And behavior x equals 0 doesn't even matter in this problem. But just so you know, if the graph goes through the origin, if it looks like this, then it's a sine graph. If it goes through. Uh, like this, if it goes through a point 0 comma a, where a is the amplitude, then that's a cosine graph. Which of the following is equivalent to this? So using logarithms is very important. So some formulas to keep in mind. If b to the x equals y, that means that log b y equals log of y divided by log of b, that's equal to x, okay? So imagine I give you a problem like 2 to the x equals 5. How do you solve this? You plug it into a log expression on your calculator because there's no way to solve this by hand. So you do, uh, you can either plug this in or plug this in. Usually it's easier to do the one on the right. I'll just write both ways out. So log b y equals log of five divided by log of two. You can plug that in, you'll get an answer. So you're doing the same thing here. You're just gonna plug this into um, this form right here and you'll get the answer. So it's gonna be log of uh, five, 625. So that's your answer. Last problem is unit circle geometry. I'm not going to walk you through the entire unit circle because that's going to take 20, 25 minutes. But there are videos on the website, on our website, where I tutor students and we have more content than what we have on the on the YouTube channel where you can check out stuff related to the unit circle. Specific problems, problem sets, um, data from practice exams, you know, on, on how often this problem type shows up, as well as videos specifically for this skill to teach you unit circle and make sure you understand it before test day. So if you want to learn it, feel free to go there. I'll give you a very basic rundown here. Tan pi equals what? So what is tan pi? If you plug it into your calculator, you're, you're going to get an answer. So you could just plug it in and that's kind of the easy way out. Just so you understand it though, the unit circle is essentially a circle with radius one that you can plot. If I look at the circle, so let me plot it really quick. There we go. So you measure the angles of the circle from this direction, uh, from this point going this way, okay? So um, if we wanna do pi, pi corresponds to 180 degrees. So I have to go 180 degrees around. That's gonna be right here. So what is the tan ratio here? Tan uh, is, uh, actually, I'm not even gonna try to walk you through the entire thing. That's gonna take way too much time and it's not worth it. I recommend if you run into a problem like this, just plug it into your calculator, okay? So if you plug in tan of 180, or if you have it in radians, tan of pi, you're gonna get a decimal version of the answer. It should be uh, probably a negative number. I'm forgetting what exactly it is. But you can plug it in and you'll get the right answer, okay? That's how you can do these problems typically. Uh, for more advanced unit circle stuff, I recommend you check out the website where, like I said, we tutor students, we've helped students improve five to nine points even within a month. Um, we can do our best to help you do the same if you have a short time frame and if you want to improve your score very quickly. So I recommend you head to the fiveacademy.com. It's linked down below. We have free tutoring, free practice exam resources, and we're always adding new content there for you guys to for free. So I recommend you check out our site. Um, that's it for me. If you have any questions, leave them down below or better yet, head to our website and leave a question there because I help students out directly through the website chat that we have. All right. So best of luck. I'll talk to you guys soon. See ya.